would like to say thank you to the cast and for Jake because he put on a wonderful performance. Um, this play was created in 1995 in America and I've seen many, many, many performances all over the world. And as you can imagine, it is each time very emotional to see what has happened. And of course, the worst thing is that my family hasn't made it. Um, <clears throat> it is important to tell, especially to young people, what has happened because it's after all now 70, 75 years ago that all this happened. And it, um, the older people, of course, remember the hardship that the whole war was about. But the young people have never experienced, thank God, not anything like that. But they have to be reminded of what can happen if we are not careful. And this is unfortunately now, um, after Auschwitz, when I came back, people said, never again anything like Auschwitz. We have learned our lesson. And the first perhaps 10 years, 15 years, there was harmony, there was peace. People were trying to put their life together. But then the war started in Cambodia, and Korea, and Vietnam, and even Europe. So, um, and now of course again in Syria, in uh, different countries in Africa, and everywhere. So, and the discrimination, the hatred against people who are different from us is still there, or again there. And um, refugees are all over the world again trying to find a new home. And again, the world is closing their doors for them. So this is what we have to work to create a safer and better world for the future generation for our children. And the young people should take, take part in this, in this better world that we are trying to create for everybody. Thank you. Uh, on this moment, on this tour, we have 350 pupils coming from schools and communities. And on Wednesday, we'll actually have 50 year old people. So, he is a child's advocate of educating him. Uh, so, she'd be blessed to be here. Should we start some questions? Sure, sure. I would like to ask a question. I'd like to start with all the questions for anyone in the audience. Can we get a wonderful day, guys, please? <coughs> Very, very much for what's going on here tonight. It's been very, very interesting. Um, I've been to Auschwitz a couple of years ago. My question to you is Can you ever forgive the German people for what went on in the 1940s? Um, well, this was a trouble, you know. Um, for years and years, people didn't want to speak about it, didn't want to hear, so we had to kind of live with it. And the hatred was still there for many, many, many years. And it was Otto Frank who lost the whole family. And he came very often to our house. And he said, um, and he knew I was full of hate. And I said to him, you know, I hate not only the Germans and not only the Nazis, but really the whole world. Because if America, Canada, Australia, even the European, England, would have taken in the refugees um, who wanted to escape from the occupied uh, parts of the country where Hitler was, the Holocaust wouldn't have happened. But in 1938, so when Hitler came into Austria and then after Belgium and France and Greece, by that time, all the countries had closed the borders for Jewish refugees. And Hitler knew this, of course, and he realized if I'm going to kill Jewish people, nobody was going to care. And this is really what happened. Just a few days ago, there was a program on BBC2 about that the Allies should have owned the um, railway lines. Because from all over Europe, um, railway lines went to the Poland, so in the middle of uh, Europe. But if those railway lines would not have existed, it couldn't have happened. And um, the Allies debated it and thought about it. And Churchill was asked very often about that. And he said it didn't belong to the war effort. Well, effort. So he didn't really care if Jewish people were going to be cast. Thank you. 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 Th
Thank you very much. Well, really, I mean, they try to get a place for Jewish people, and the way, of course, Africa, people in China, a few um, hundreds were able to escape, but six million people were caught in this Holocaust and murdered. John Hitchcock, great celebration of Russian orders. Thank you. I lived in Germany soon after the war was over. I went to Belgium and saw where I might go. But also, I was a liberator. I spent my youth learning about war, about killing. I was uh, aboard a, a, a warship built in America. And the aid that we had was phenomenal. If I went to Russia and on Russian convoys and you surprised how many uh, oh, American ships were sailing to Russia guarded by British sailors. And all of this leads you into a great mismatch. It is very difficult for young people today to understand what went on how things work, and I think the trouble is, the information, unlike what we had tonight, which was a personal experience, really brings it home to you. But my personal experience, of course, is totally different. I was on the other side of the planet. But nonetheless, I was able to return this year aboard the ship Budica, and it was built as the voyage of remembrance. And my memory is good. I am still able to think of these things. And what is more, I was able to go to the Memorial Arboretum and in the middle of a very special performance of the summer prompt, read out my poem that I had written about remembrance. And it's just just to give you an idea, the first line is, we who remain, remember, those friends who share the life. <coughs> and I feel so strong seeing this enactment tonight and meeting someone like yourself, a fabulous person. It is overwhelming. But I am 94 and have seen quite a lot as well. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
tolerance in us suddenly, that people who are not thinking and doing the same thing, not the religion, not the same color, we um, should be uh, differentiated and uh, less worse than what we are as a white race. And um, this is really what we have to start to accept, that we are all human beings and it doesn't matter what religion. Religion is actually um, was created as an uplifting thing. It should help us to make a better life, to become good people, and it just does the opposite. And this is something I really don't understand, and I work with it that all the religions should work together to have a more harmonious and peaceful world. Because religion actually is still very powerful. But as I say, I'm not afraid at the moment about antisemitism. Thank you. Just a silly three story. We were in Rwanda, we were at the memorial gardens, and they were having a funeral because they found enough bits of bodies to have a funeral in there uh, some time after the um, that situation. It's, it's worldwide, isn't it? The genocide is worldwide, Rwanda. Yeah, I've been in very familiar obviously with the Holocaust story but you being in such a few not met some
contact with a grandparent, with a parent. Now a lot of this contact is lost. So I think family life is very, very important. In America, I had a case, a, a school like this, a private school, um, and the children were doing the swastikas, and it was a lot at the party. And it got into social media, and the children were expelled, and um, I just happened to be was in California to be called to go and speak to the school, the parents and the children. Um, who have spelled so they're called back. And I asked the children, um, why did you do that? Did you not realize that would hurt a lot of um, Jewish people all around the world? And they said, we didn't know what it meant. So I asked the teacher, um, don't be 16 years old, don't they learn about the Holocaust? Well, we have done American history till now. The Holocaust studies will come later. And the parents were there. And so, you know, that not everything has to come from the school. The parents as well have to tell children what is happening in the world. And the parents were actually very ashamed. Well, you know, the children, we don't really talk much with them. They have their computers, when they come home, they go in their room. And, you know, this has to change. Parents have a responsibility to as well teach the children what is going on in the world and teach them to behave and to embrace other religions. It can't all come from schools. school to hear me and in the evening they came home and they were talking about it. 
and the daughter asks the mother, what did grandfather actually do in the war? And the mother, she said, I was in shock to answer, but I did answer. I said, my father was a Nazi. He fought in Russia. He killed many, many Jews in Poland, in Russia. And um, when he, came, he was a teacher, and when he came back, he couldn't teach anymore. He occupied himself only with philosophy and religion. I didn't really have a father. He never smiled at me, he never played with me. And, um, and never, and in this it was a long time. And um, I never told my husband or my other children, never spoke about that. And she said to me that now is in the open, now she can relax again and hopes that her children will realize what has happened in the war. And um, I didn't answer for a long time, I was digesting this letter, um, and then I wrote back to her, I don't think your father was an evil man, but this is what war does to people. And I've heard as well from in America from people who are fighting in Vietnam. Um, they are very decent people and they get orders to kill people. And the first one is terrible, the second is bad, the third is just automatic. So um, this is another reason why we have to stop wars, making arm armament. I know that's a big industry, but the industries could make things which we need and not with armament. And wars really change the attitude of people. And like so Hitler used, you know, he can talk as a young boy, he can it's five, six years it's old already, and the propaganda they're told, and when they are sixteen, seventeen, it just makes sense what we have to do. So um, you know, we have to educate children what is good and what is bad, and especially wars, we have to try to fight against having wars. Government should not um, weapons, and especially if we would have a nuclear war, it could really destroy <coughs> our world. Climate change, okay, we have to demonstrate as well, but against wars and armament, we should demonstrate even more. Mm -hmm. okay. I guys, we have one more question before we head to the exhibition. I have to the side, thank you. students 
who protested the white robbers, it's a book, it's a play, it's a film. Um, many, many were executed, young students who were protesting against what is going on in Germany. Thank you, Igor. I suppose we could just stop up for a second. Could you just then come and talk about Hines and your little brother? Because as we go next to the next part of the event, we have a reception for you in the exhibition there with lots of Yeah. Just a moment for the audience to come. Yeah, well, my brother um, was a, 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 a very wonderful, very, very clever young man, um, very musical. He had a great talent. He can already, when he's 10 years old, he could already play the Rhapsody in Blue. Um, Gershwin, very difficult uh, piece of music by heart. Um, he had an accordion and a guitar. He could actually play any instrument you gave him. Um, but he was a very, very gentle young man. And um, in hiding, of course, you had to be quiet. Like you saw, we had to sit still day in, day night and um, <coughs> not make any noise. And so, of course, he couldn't make any music. And so he decided he would start to paint. And of course, you know, at school you do a bit of drawing and so on, but you've never done anything with oil painting. But he created some amazing oil paintings. And, um, and, <coughs> and, um, but it's again a long story about, um, about the paintings are hidden during the war then and then before they were arrested. And after the war, my mother and me um, found them again. And a few years ago, I donated them to the Resistance Museum in Amsterdam. But um, we made lots of copies of them, which are, um, well, reproductions and things like that. I've got several exhibitions of this as well. And as well, he wrote many, many poems, um, but mainly about dying and being afraid of, yeah, of what will happen to him when he dies. And um, so I wrote actually three books. They're all here um, for sale. The second book, The Promise, is about Heinz's short life because when he was um, 12 years old, um, he asked me at night, we shared a room in Amsterdam, he said, what will happen when we die? I'm afraid. And I said, well, I don't know, that's what our father was the answers to everything. And in the morning, we went to him, and he said, Papi, what will happen when I die? And my father said, well, of course, your body will integrate, but once you have children, you will live on in your children. And then this 12-year-old boy said, but what if I died before I had children? And my father thought for a little moment, and then he said, well, nothing gets lost. We are all a chain, um, which goes from generation to generation. And whatever you have done, somebody will remember, and you won't be forgotten. And well, he had to accept this, of course, and so I tried to um, write this book, the promise to keep the promise to my father, the time will be forgotten. Because very often my mother and me said, um, Anna, of course, she has become immortal, because everybody knows about her. But Heinz, who was as well such a gentle, wonderful, talented young man, nobody knows about him. So, and in South Africa, they created, um, when I told the story about this, um, they created an exhibition um, which traveled all over South Africa, and we got a copy now in England, and um, um, the school was so wonderful to try to get this exhibition, which is at the Jewish Museum, and it's for renting out to go into schools and other venues. So thank you very much, much for the school and for um, to organize this so we can see the exhibition and um, have the books as well available. Absolutely. Please enjoy the books, guys. And tomorrow, uh, interestingly, we will unveil uh, a memorial bench in Heinz's memory uh, and we'll overlook the Anglican <coughs> Sapphire that's now four years old going to school grounds of toddlers. So I'll be talking to some of one of our students, alumni now, and uh, initiated. So it's going to be linked together and it's an honor to be here.
And thank you so much for sharing your thoughts with us. I just want to tell one more little story. Um, I've just come back from Vienna, Austria, where they're going to make a documentary about my life. And um, first we went to London to interview me, then Vienna, then I'm still going to Amsterdam. But um, I had from the Red Cross, I heard um, in 1948, they sent us a letter um, that my father and brother perished in Mauthausen. Uh, which was liberated by the Americans several days before the Americans came to liberate that camp. And that was, of course, for us terrible that they would nearly have made it. And um, when I was now in Vienna, the film crew said, do you want to go to Mauthausen to see where your father and brother perished? I never wanted to go there, but I thought, well, um, Perhaps now that I'm so near, perhaps I should go and see it. And I went there, and it is a horrible, horrible camp. There are stone quarries, and the people were just thrown down from the top. And um, then they told me, your father and brother was here for two days, but then they were taken to a different camp called Ebensee, which was 100 miles from Mount Housen. I've never ever heard his name. I asked many people if they've ever heard his name, they really knew about him. And that was, there were about 20 camps in this area where um, the Nazis were, um, it's a mountainous area, and they made big caves. The caves is too small, huge, huge, um, digging into these mountains where they made the armament because the cities were bombed. So they could be really the factors and all. So they made it in those under the mountains. They made aeroplanes, like, uh, tanks, all kind of terrible, terrible things. And those inmates had to first make those caves and then work in them. And towards March, April, they didn't get any food. Um, the conditions, they have all the documents there. And I always thought my father um, had survived my brother because he was very strong. But it turned out that my father died in March already. They have the papers there. And my brother died, he died several days before the camp was liberated. My father was cremated. My brother ended up in a mass grave. Um, and they, after 80 years hearing all this, it was a terrible shock for me. And, um, it, yeah, it's, and you know, I have never spoken yet about this because it just happened for a few days ago that I really heard about all this. And um, so the Austrians who always said they were victims themselves had those terrible, terrible camps where they killed many, many, many tens and tens and thousands of people. There are memorial names there, and they have a wall with from here to here um, with names on it in this even, even they could have passed that Thank you so much for sharing the Thank you.